Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and uh, first of all, um, thank you all for being here. We really appreciate you all taking the time this afternoon. Uh, it's my pleasure today to welcome you to the de to the Dr. N. Philip Sassman Lecture. Uh, we are grateful for the support of, uh, from Dr. Sassman, along with our host, Dr. Jan, uh, Dr. Jan Sassman, to make this lecture possible. The Sassman support of this endowed lectureship provides an opportunity for scientists and mathematicians from historically underrepresented groups to speak to students on Auburn's campus. Dr. Anne Sassman received her BS in chemistry from Auburn University in 1965. I later earned a PhD from Duke University in microbiology, um, in microbiology and immunology. She had a long and storied career in research and research administration at the National Institutes of Health and retired from the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences in Research Triangle Park as a director of the Division of Extramural Research and Training, where she grew the staff from three to more than 20 program officers. Dr. Sassman is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and is a for former member of the Bennett College Board of Trustees. Although um, the Sassmans are not here today, um, it's without their, gen their generosity makes this uh, lecture series possible. And uh, would you all join me in um, providing a round of applause for the Sassmans who are making today possible? <laughs> And with that, I'm going to turn this over to Jalen Robinson, who is the Vice President of the Society of Women in Science and Math. So, Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I am Shailen Robinson, a passionate biomedical science major and pre-PA student going from the vibrant city of Birmingham, Alabama. Currently serving as the Vice President of the Society for Women in Science and Mathematics, I am dedicated to fostering a supportive community that champions professional growth, workplace equality, and a sense of belonging within the, the, within the STEM industry. At SWISM, our mission extends beyond creating awareness about the numerous opportunities available for women in science and mathematics. We also strive to provide valuable insights into career development, financial literacy, and effective networking. Allow me to introduce our esteemed guest speaker, Dr. Emily Wilden, a distinguished leader in the field of biomedical research and transformative healthcare strategies. Dr. Emily Wilden received her Bachelor of Science from Auburn University and a PhD in cell biology from the University of Alabama at Birmingham. She currently serves as the Associate Vice President of Strategy and Impact. In this role, she oversees a $100 million portfolio of internal research programs at MD Anderson Cancer Center. She works closely with the Chief Scientific Officer to develop, operationalize, and manage team-based research programs within the institution and with high-profile sponsors and, and donors. For a decade, she worked as a lab program manager and later as a director of research where she developed and oversaw a $30 million research portfolio that included government and foundation grants clinical and translation industry alliances, and philanthropic programs. Dr. Rotary has been, has been honored with several prestigious awards, including the Exemplary Employee Award from the Division of Cancer Medicine at MD Anderson Cancer Center in 2015, the Rosanna's Foundation for Fighting Lung Cancer Hope Award in 2016, and the Under 40 Rising Star in Healthcare Recognition of Becker Hospital Review in 2019. Dr. Rory is the mother of two young daughters, so setting an example for them to be both loving mothers and capable professionals is important to her. Her advice for students would be, hard work, honesty, and following through on your commitments will get you 80% of the way. Emotional intelligence and clear communication will complete the job. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Emily Rory. Thank you so much. It is um, surreal <laughs> to be here back at Auburn uh, giving the Sassman Lecture, and I very much appreciate the opportunity to present to you all today. 
So um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of background on myself and my career journey, how I got to where I am today. We'll talk about what I do now in my current role, which is an administrative role and not, not really overseeing research directly in a lab, but overseeing programmatic work. And then we'll follow up with a quick summary. So, oops, um, here we are. So I came to Auburn with dreams of helping others and utilizing my interest and aptitude in science and mathematics. I had done well in these classes in high school, and I grew up in a small city in Louisiana. My parents were both pharmacists. And I knew female physicians, and I knew female engineers, but I didn't know a single female college professor, despite there being a university in my hometown. So I didn't have any idea about careers in science and mathematics outside of like a pre-med type of, you know, transition. I always thought I'd end up becoming a pediatrician or something like that. So I took a course um, in COSAM my first quarter at Auburn which did exactly what it was designed to do, and it weeded me out of the pre-med field. <laughs> it uh, talked about how hard it was to get into medical school and um, how I had to volunteer outside of all the courses I was taking. And, you know, I had to have, be like in the top percent of my class and then also have all this like crazy volunteer experience. So at the time, I was taking calculus, biology, chemistry, and probably English or history or something like that. I had a work-study job. I was working 20 hours a week in a lab on campus. So I was pretty maxed out. And the thought of doing even more felt very overwhelming to me. Um, so as I waited through those first years and got through the core coursework, I began to have more satisfaction and interest in my research classes. And as they became more specialized, I became even more interested. So specifically my genetics course with Dr. Michael Wooten and later my work in Dr. Goodwin's lab led me to redirect my interest and focus in on a research career. I eventually graduated from Auburn in December of 2001, a whole semester early, with a bachelor's degree in molecular biology. So throughout that time though, I had a number of instructors and in courses that had a formative impact on my development as a scientist, specifically those taught by Drs. Moss, Wooten, Feminella, and later my work with Dr. Goodwin in his lab were incredibly impactful. They gave me the advantage of seeing kind of the passion for science that people had in just even instructing their work, and it was infectious or contagious. I could feel it. And I wasn't really interested in exploring animal biology as like a career, but I just remember thinking this is so interesting, and he's clearly so excited about what he's doing. And I remember the same thing with Dr. Wooten's classes as well. So that seemed, you know, kind of like, Probably my friends weren't getting as excited about that work at the same time, so maybe something that was unique and I should explore. I think it was my second year at Auburn that I met Dr. Goodwin, maybe the end of my first. He became my COSAM advisor, and he was new to Auburn. And so he um, was probably the first one to talk to me about pursuing a career as a scientist. I had never considered going to get a PhD before that conversation. And because he was new, and I was new in his lab, he then accepted me to take on a, that work-study position and move it to his lab. And he taught me side by side a lot of the same fundamental techniques that I used later when I was actually at the bench, pipetting. I remember teaching me how to pipette, um, running PCRs, designing primers, um, and really the perseverance that it takes to be a scientist. I could see the life that he was sort of leading. It's not like it was easier than going to medical school in any way. Um, that career for him, he was there all the time, on the weekends, working all the time. Um, and so he was an incredibly impactful mentor for me early on in my career. And I think he was the first person I called after I took the GRE to talk to him about my scores and what they meant and whether I had to retake it and all of that. So um, because of all that strong laboratory experience and the experiences I had with him, I got into many different PhD programs but I decided to go to UAB for the next step. And so during my first year at UAB, I was rotating through various labs and weeding through the core coursework you take as a graduate student. And I took a course on cell signaling and I was hooked. I loved learning about the network of pathways that control a cell's response to different stimuli 
uh, cells fate. And all of this would result in activation of transcription of new genes, induction of negative regulators, how these complex networks work together that could influence a cell's actual behavior or response. And then that that could change like the way cells interacted with each other and even how like tissues became developed or disordered was just absolutely fascinating to me. And so I thought it was just such an interesting concept that all of these signals are going on in, to a cell at the exact same time. And a cell has the ability to adjust the system, its own system, to achieve whatever that desired effect is. And whenever that becomes disordered, then you, you know, have pathologic conditions like cancer, or autoimmune diseases, or anything like that. And so this became kind of a theme that you'll see throughout, is that understanding how all these things get thrown at you and how you adjust your own system to be able to persevere through all of that becomes really important. And so it was because of this interest in cell biology that I decided to choose a lab that focused on that for graduate school. And in 2007, I defended my thesis and began looking for postdoctoral positions. And so I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do as a career at this point. This was 2007. And we could not talk openly about the fact that there were not enough academic positions available for people <laughs> when they were going to be finished with their training. Everyone pretended like that was sort of what we had to do. And so I remember even looking for postdocs at the time. And, and, my, and my PhD mentor was well aware that this was maybe not the path that I was going to choose. But she said, when you're looking for a postdoc, you have to tell them that you want to become an NIH-funded investigator because you will not get hired. And she was right. I mean, I told everyone, and it's like as soon as I said the words, each person I interviewed with like nodded, like, OK, great, you can come. <laughs> so, um, so I knew that it was sort of a tricky position to be in. So um, I was a, a dual career couple at that point. And so my husband and I both found postdoc positions in Houston. And so I joined a lab at MD Anderson Cancer Center as a postdoc. And unsurprisingly, I was not there very long before I realized that was not the career that I wanted to do. I enjoyed thinking about science. I enjoyed writing about science. I even enjoyed like talking about science. But actually physically doing science was not bringing me any level of happiness <laughs> on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I began teaching part-time at Houston Community College at night. Uh, in the shadows of the night. I did not tell my PhD or my postdoc mentor um, because I wanted to just gain experience doing something else. And I had only been trained as sort of an academic scientist at that point. So I didn't have to TA or anything during graduate school, which was great. But then I didn't have any teaching experience either. So I went back and was like, let me do this. And so during this time, I started meeting with basically anyone who would take the time to meet with me. Um, and through many of these conversations and informal meetings, I met a woman who was a trained scientist who was working in um, the thoracic head and neck medical oncology department at MD Anderson, working for a physician scientist who seemed to be too busy to write his own grants or manage his own lab or, or anything. <laughs> so um, she got in touch with me years later when she was leaving that position because she was going to be spending more time at home and wanted to take a break from her, her job and asked me if I wanted to take the job. So I was so happy and so fortunate, so I took it. And so this was sort of the first time that my hard work felt like it was paying off. So I took all of that work ethic that I had developed in undergrad and graduate school and as a postdoc and then applied it to this new job and worked with the same rigor and vigor that I did back then. And for once, you know, it was recognized, or I felt like it had been recognized. So my contributions to the research program then truly did make a difference. And so it wasn't an overnight success. So before we go any farther, <laughs> I think we need to be very honest about career trajectories. I think they're not linear. And so often when we talk about career trajectories, I think when you're in that hunt, you think it should be this straight line, this diagonal line to the top, and it's not. And um, my postdoc years were not great. <laughs> my postdoc mentor was um, older, and he didn't remember 
things from meeting to meeting. So I would show him data and he didn't remember that I had showed him the same data two weeks ago, which sort of worked in my favor sometimes. <laughs> um, but there was also like a group of people who I thought maybe were not being completely honest with their data and they had a related project. So there were many, many times, and I have some family members on the call, they can attest that like I would go out at lunchtime and call them from the parking lot and be like, this is so bad. I don't know how to get out of this. Like, you know, it was just a really difficult place to be. I had a hard time finding that job once I had actually sort of made the decision it was time to leave. While I taught and that gave me a good amount of satisfaction, even if I chose it to do it full time, it would have not even paid me what I was making as a postdoc. And that was truly not even enough money to live in Houston and start paying on my student loans. So I think being very honest about all of this is very important as you're developing your career. It's not always gonna be straightforward and it's not always gonna be easy, but in the end, hopefully your hard work and perseverance are gonna win out. In the end, I ended up volunteering some nights at MD Anderson. It's just like a, a thing I decided to do and to start handing out hats to patients who were receiving chemo. So I pushed around this hat cart and seeing people on those days when I was so not happy in the role that I was in was an incredibly impactful experience for me. It grounded me, it reset my days on the days that I thought I had had a bad day. I had not had a bad day at all. I could see people who were going through much worse things than I was, than I was going through at the time. And I used this time this sort of career uncertainty time to really think about the things I could do better, right? It's hard, it's hard when it feels like everything's not going right to think about how do I improve these small things. And so even talking with patients and having communication with people who are not scientists is actually really important. Being able to talk to a lay audience about what you do is very important and that's a skill I use all the time today. And so honing these skills early on and sort of recognizing gaps in where I could grow really did help. And so taking that opportunity to do that really did help me at the time. And so again, how did I adjust the system to achieve that effect? I looked for gaps. I tried to improve them and figure out ways to make them better. So I, th you know, I was so motivated to improve that situation that once I did enter the job that I wanted, I just excelled because I poured everything I had into it. And honestly, what people will tell you, but I mean, not really just own up, is that I, a lot of good luck happened. And that is so much of success as well, is just being in the right place at the right time. The guy I went to work for who didn't have time to write his own grants, he became the chair of the department. And so that opened up a huge amount of opportunities for me because he took on a lot of administrative responsibilities. So I learned about clinical research and clinical operations and working with industries and establishing contracts and negotiating IP terms and things that I had never really thought about before when I was just writing grants. I helped him get more grants. We wrote a lot of grants together. We wrote multi-institutional grants, programmatic grants, and then at the time, the president, the then president of MD Anderson was Ron DePino. And he announced a new institutional research program called the Moonshots Program. And then my entire life changed from that point forward. So the Moonshots Program was inspired by President Kennedy's speech at Rice University ahead of the Apollo missions. And Dr. DePino announced a call to cure cancer, a bold call, not because it is easy, but because it is hard. At the time, Dr. DiPino was just a few years into his tenure at, as president at MD Anderson, but what he saw at MD Anderson was no different than what he had seen at Dana-Farber when he was there before or the institutions prior. People, people work within the confines they know. And so all the medical oncologists work with medical oncologists. It's very, very siloed. Surgeons work with surgeons. Radi radiation oncologists work within their teams epidemiologists are the same, and, and the basic science is sort of stuck to themselves, all within MD Anderson. And so the Moonshots program sort of forced our institution to think differently and our faculty to think differently. Again, we're asking how do you adjust the system to achieve that effect that you want. He challenged disease site teams to develop comprehensive programs to eliminate cancer in the next decade focusing on the entire cancer continuum, not just developing new treatments and you know, lab-based things, but 
How do we prevent kids from ever starting to smoke cigarettes? How do we long-term prevent, you know, really impactful cancers? And so, you know, how do we improve treatments for our late stage patients? And these are, you know, the same patients I was handing out hats to just a few years before. So all of this rang very true to me and felt very much called to like my own pers personal mission. So disease site teams were formed across the institution. New institutional platforms were established. Groups of scientists who had never worked together began working together. Industry level expertise and platforms came into the institution for the first time, and all of us were working together with the single goal of improving survival rates and accelerating research that had the highest likelihood of helping cancer patients. The concepts of the moonshots would rely on a bolus of institutional philanthropic dollars, which would be used to establish these teams and make the initial discoveries, with long term funding being provided from alliance, major industry alliances, grants, and IP revenue generation. And so there were a handful of programs funded at first, and it later expanded. But my role in the Moonshots program was a new one to the institution. My title at the time, I was still in thoracic head and neck medical oncology, and it was administrative director of research programs for that department, which is a great title. I was happy with it. <laughs> I oversaw all the chairs, lab, and departmental research, but, these, but also these larger programmatic efforts like the Moonshot. But the other disease sites that are listed here did not have anyone like me in their role. And so um, because I was a scientist and also sort of a self-trained administrator, I had unique skills to bear to manage the Moonshot, which had different requirements than a traditional grant. We reported out on a quarterly basis. Funds were awarded or not awarded annually, so it allowed for sort of very rapid review of the program success. And because our department also saw head and neck cancer patients, I was soon asked to oversee the HPV-driven cancers moonshot, as HPV infection is known to be a cause of oral cancers. I was the only person like me at the institution, and soon I began to be recognized for this unique skill set. And so, at the time, this guy, Julio Dryetta, was the head of the drug discovery platform at MD Anderson and the faculty leader of the Moonshots. He had come from Dana-Farber with Dr. DePino to MD Anderson, and he had a long storied history in pharmaceutical industries prior to that. And he requested a meeting with me. Um, he wanted to learn about what I did, I think he actually just said, what do you do? Like, tell me about you. Um, what are you doing in the moonshots and in the department? What do you do? Um, he asked me to share my written job description with him, so I did. And then from that, an entire new career was established at the institution. He had MD Anderson look at its career ladder, and the traditional path is the one you see here. This was sort of the path I was on. They were sort of fitting me into different titles that fit into this administrative ladder. Um, I actually didn't qualify for those first two in green when I uh, had applied as a postdoc. They just sort of made up a title for me because I didn't actually even qualify for that because I didn't have the administrative skill set at the time. And so what he did was had HR create an entire new system of um, ladder of uh, job titles. So um, I quickly uh, advanced through these ranks uh, shown here, but that one single conversation with Julio changed, you know, dozens of people's lives who now totally have this title at the institution. And so every single moonshot disease site then had a scientific project director or manager managing it um, and every single platform. And from my role in the thoracic department, I was then asked to oversee interviewing for the panels of people who applied for these jobs, um, help, helping leadership decide who was best for the program. And at this time, I was also managing a team of grant managers and clinical coordinators in our same academic department. And they helped consent patients and collect tissue samples. So I had a good understanding of translational research at the time. I had about 15 people in my direct oversight and departmentally, we began looking at ways to improve career progression for everybody, not just people with my background. So bear with me. We did this very elementary feeling exercise as a team. 
And then everyone across the department did it as well. So I told everyone when we sat down, like, this is going to feel very elementary. But you have to take it seriously. And if we all do this together seriously, we'll all be able to kind of visualize what it is we want to do with our careers and our lives. So if we use this tree as an analogy for our careers and put kind of the work that you did that's fundamental to who you are at the base or the roots of the tree, right? So I have a bachelor's degree. I worked in a lab for a little bit. I got a PhD and a postdoc. And then I advance through different things. So we have biology and chart over here. So that's sort of like a leaf that's fallen at some point, right? And so um, really, if you can map out at the top of the tree, where do you want to be when you retire? So what is the job you want when you are going to just call it quits in however many years, right? So I had everyone on my team from like right out of college, 22-year-olds to like 65-year-olds. So People are taking this, right, with different, they may be at the top of their tree, and that's fine, but it at least opened up the conversation to say, are you where you want to be? If not, let's figure out how to get you there. So I did it myself as well. And then I think at the time I was the director of research in the department, which I had gotten, again, recognized for the work that I was doing. And so I thought about like what's next if I think about what's coming next at MD Anderson or yeah what what's coming next at MD Anderson we were sort of tied we're tied to Houston I mean my husband has a faculty position at Baylor we're there we're happy I had just had my first daughter so it was like I'm not moving we're not moving anytime soon so within MD Anderson what are the jobs that I can look at and so I thought, well, that's an easy next one. That's just one title up. I don't have to think very hard about that. But then what do I want to do when I retire? I have no idea. And so almost sort of, you know, as a stretch goal and just a little bit, you know, without thought, I put vice president of research on the title. And so what this exercise really did and I'm not a proponent of things like vision boards in any way. This is probably the only time I've ever said that phrase. But it really did create a vision for me to imagine what I wanted to do um, and what I needed to do to get there. And so recognizing, again, the gaps I had then to what I needed to be and what I needed to develop. And so I posted this in my office. And then when people would come in, we'd talk about it. And it just was there for me to look at. Um, and so I began doing what I had already done, right? I had been in the, this position, a version of this position, for about eight years. It was probably time for me to start looking at what the next step was. So I did what I had done years ago when I was a postdoc. I just started meeting with a bunch of people. And so I met with executive directors. I met with associate vice presidents. I met with anybody who would meet with me and take in the lunch or go get a coffee and talk about opportunities. Um, and it wasn't necessarily to get a job that day, but just opening the door and the conversations that we had was so helpful to me later on in my career. And so that did lead me to be exactly where I am today. If we skip ahead to that whole metal part, <laughs> here's where we sit. So MD Anderson is a whole new president, Peter Pisters. Ron DePino is no longer there. And this guy that asked me, what is your job? What do you do? Tell me about it. He's now the chief scientific officer, and he's now my boss. He oversees all of clinical and basic research, and this is his org chart, and this is me right there by the red arrow. So one pretty solid place to sit on an org chart. I feel pretty good about that. <laughs> Two, not too far off from the top of my tree. So this is all just sort of like crazy to me if you think about the fact that I was teaching at a community college at night trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life with not that long ago struggling to pay bills honestly to now it is just completely unreal and so I'm doing what I thought I'd always want to do when I retired and I'm nowhere near retirement so I have no idea what's at the top of my tree now um, but what I do with Julia Dryad is I oversee all of our internal research programs. So MD Anderson invests a lot of money, philanthropic money and other institutional dollars in internal research programs, which I'm going to tell you about today. And with um, Andy Futriel, who's the vice president of strategic research programs, he and I work with faculty to develop, manage, and oversee multidisciplinary programs and research. 
So these are the programs that I oversee. They are diverse and they largely focus on institutional investments. I do have a box here for external research programs, which I'll talk about at the end of the, end of the talk. I talked about the Moonshots program a good bit earlier and I'll come back to that again. We're approaching nearly 12 years of funding from the Moonshots and um, there are other institutional programs like Therapeutics Discovery Division, which is focusing on developing new small and large molecules for clinical development. And again, the sense of the investments we're talking about from just the left portion, the internal research programs, that whole bucket is a $100 million annual portfolio. And so those are institutional dollars that we budget every year to spend on internal research programs. And so to give you a bigger sense, the entire MD Anderson research budget is a little bit over a billion dollars. And to give you a sense of how that compares is the NIH's whole budget for the entire, or N NCI, sorry, for the entire National Cancer Institute is $7 billion. So that's a large, <laughs> Um, a large amount of money for a single institution to spend on research. So we're very fortunate to have the resources to do that. And none of these are clinical dollars, none of these are generated from clinical revenue. So I work, in the middle section, I work really closely with philanthropy and my colleagues there to shepherd institutional fundraising programs. I'm gonna talk to you today about the Cancer Neuroscience Program and the Allison Institute. And then outside of MD Anderson, I work um, really closely with a handful of collaborators. Um, we have colleagues at UT Austin that we're establishing a relationship with um, and, and having jointly funded research programs. I'll talk to you a little bit today also about Breakthrough Cancer, which is a new foundation that's been established by Tyler Jacks, who um, is at MIT, and he's the president of Breakthrough Cancer Foundation, and so I helped um, I help oversee that from an institutional perspective as well. So starting with our internal research programs and really focusing on the Moonshots program again, you saw, you've seen this slide a lot, but more than a decade ago, the program was established long before President Obama had the National Moonshot Initiative. In fact, around the time that we kicked this off about a year later, Bi then Vice President Biden was in town um, at MD Anderson, and he learned about the moonshots, and very soon after, a national moonshot campaign was launched. Um, a fun fact is that um, we have the trademark for the term moonshots, and the White House licenses the trademark from us. Um, that license has expired. We've asked them to just take the whole trademark at this point, and they don't want to. They keep licensing it from us. So. Um, Soon after, when the moonshot was announced, um, you know, this gained a little bit more national attention. Today in 2024, we currently fund 15 different disease sites and focus areas. I mentioned before, these are multidisciplinary teams aimed at impacting patient care in the near term. They often involve understanding new mechanisms of therapeutic resistance in patients or identifying new therapies that have clinical potential. Disease site investments alone are approximately $20 million annually. And within each disease site proposal, uh, the faculty will propose one to three projects to get funded. They're funded on an annual basis. We have an external advisory board who advises us every year on the programs that we should fund on that annual basis. We reward faculty. We ask them to take high risk, high reward projects that wouldn't be funded by NIH or other sort of traditional funding mechanisms and ask them to use this mechanism to do that. So if they have to make quick decisions and kill a program mid-year, we reward that. We try to encourage faculty to do that. That allows them the ability to pivot to the more important problem that they may need to be solving. Um, and so even if that comes up mid-year, that's something we encourage. And so the right-hand side of the, the slide really shows you the platforms. Um, these are one of the more unique aspects of the Moonshots program. These were established at the same time the Moonshots program kicked off. These are industry-level teams of scientists aimed at partnering with disease sites and working together to translate findings to the clinic. They're like professionalized service teams. They're not core facilities. It's not just like an exchange of services for, for funding. It's a true academic collaboration um, that's developed together, overseen together, um, and carried out together. And so they contribute a significant added value um, to our overall program. 
And these are the researchers who actually do the work that I've been talking about today. So these are largely physician scientists. Um, and as I've said many times, we preferentially invest in research that starts and ends with a patient. Whether that's the profiling of patient samples that result in answering questions about mechanisms of therapeutic resistance, or it's the clinical trial that results from the deep mechanistic investigation of that resistance, that's the overall goal of the program. And so what does this look like more than a decade after funding? These are just a few of the seminal contributions to the field. They represent practice-changing research discoveries fueled by the moonshots. The CAR-NK program on the upper left-hand side originated in Katie Rezvani's lab, funded by moonshot dollars, and it's resulted in long-term benefit and, and, and survival in patients with lymphoid cancers. And that same long team that I worked with, this is the guy, this is the chair, um, they um, have identified a unique genetic mutation in a subset of lung cancer patients who demonstrate um, sensitivity to a repurposed drug. The melanoma team has recently discovered that combination immunotherapy in um, melanoma patients who have brain metastases um, has been very effective. Uh, brain metastases are typically a very poor prognosis for cancer patients, and they don't do well once, once those appear. And then finally, the CLL team has identified novel therapeutic combinations which have resulted in FDA approvals and new regimens for patients who have CLL. And now as a result, because of the work that's been done in CLL over the last decade in this team specifically, um, there's really only like a tiny subset of CLL patients who have a very poor prognosis. And so this just shows you a little bit more and reiterates some of the things I said, but highlights a few other findings. So the CLL team has had actually five FDA approvals in the last decade, resulting from Moonshot's investments. The Lung Group established a Gemini database, and basically the database collected tissue and data, profiling data, on every single lung cancer patient who walked through the door. Through that, they were able to identify these unique mutations and unique uh, therapeutic vulnerabilities. The MDS AML team has done an amazing job identifying new mechanisms of therapeutic resistance. And finally, the melanoma team has really done an incredible job across that cancer continuum. They've um, implemented legislation starting in the state of Texas, which can be a difficult place to get legislation passed, um, against indoor tanning for minors. Um, if Auburn is anything like it was when I was here 25 years ago, tanning beds are pretty popular. Mm -hmm. And so um, we've implemented legislation against tanning um, under the age of 18 in 20 U.S. states, including Texas and Poland. Um, they've also developed a sun safety curriculum for elementary school students, and over 400,000 students have been reached all over the country. They've changed the staging, um, the clinical staging of melanoma, uh, rewriting how patients are treated, and most recently, they discovered that there are certain bacteria in your gut microbiome which can influence how you respond to different types of therapies, which is pretty interesting. And so all of these programs, the Moonshots program and the programs I'm going to talk to you about, have taken focused scientific investments in a really strict governance of non-clinical capital. So these are all institutional dollars that are not derived from clinical revenue. The majority of these programs impact patient care, which has accelerated translational science and research. The research that I've described so far is all aligned with very, very specific milestones and accountability throughout the year with quarterly reporting and financial reviews. And one of the underappreciated aspects of the program um, is that it's actually driven revenue diversification for the institution because the amount of IP that's been generated from these investments, plus the number of strategic alliances we've, able, we've been able to establish with industry, um, has it's a different scale and scope than our institution has ever seen. And then we've implemented this annual external advisory board using site-specific expertise to help shape the investments from a year-to-year -year basis. And so shifting over to philanthropic priorities. So I work really closely with the philanthropy team, and there are two programs that um, I'm gonna talk to you about today. And what the opportunity here was really that, you know, once you get a bunch of money from a donor, let's say they wanna name a building or they wanna fund a program, there's not normally a lot of accountability. 
And what people found when the Moonshots program was established was that there had been faculty who were here for many, many years who were just banking, <laughs> banking donor dollars and not spending them, which isn't great for the books and it's not great for the donor who's given money and expects to see an outcome. So we apply the same principles that we've applied in Moonshots now across many different types of programs, including these two programs that I'm going to talk to you about today. And so the Cancer Neuroscience Program is one of the newest programs. It was just approved like last month. Um, it's becoming more and more apparent that the effects of stress, um, that the effects of stress can have on our overall health, just even healthy individuals, but especially in pathologic conditions like cancer. Research focused on wellness and exercise is really taking hold, even in cancer patient populations, and there are now clinical trials testing exactly that. And so, we all know the brain is a unique organ, distinct from other organs. It has different types of cells, different immune system, blood vessels, and lymphatic system. And the faculty who are leading the effort that, that this is, is they're asking comprehensive questions about these unique attributes to the brain. So we know the risk for cancer is increased by certain types of behavior. We talked about a, a few of them today, nicotine, alcohol, sun exposure, it's been sh shown in certain types of cancers that the nervous system can actually drive tumor development. And cancer treatment does often result in toxicities that are therapeutic limiting, so peripheral neuropathies and other types of um, toxicities. There's obviously a lot that we recognize today that challenges um, mental health and well-being, especially when you're faced with a cancer diagnosis. And cancer patients are often in a great deal of pain, and so they're often dis um, managed by a group even in our institution called pain management. And so that group really does, you know, the patients receive a lot of opioids, and so the addiction to opioids actually can become a problem in a number of, of patients. So understanding how all these work together um, and separately is the overall goal of the program, which is to extend the lives and eliminate suffering of patients who have cancer through comprehensive understanding of the interactions in the nervous system with cancer, enabling a holistic, a more holistic treatment of um, the patient. And so there are four areas of exploration, uh, including foundational biology, mental health, treatment toxicities, and just, you know, tumors that arise in the nervous system itself, so primary and metastatic brain tumors. And so to do that, they've organize themselves into four scientific themes focusing on neurobiology, behavioral health, toxicity, and neuro-oncology. And so this just kicked off like last month, so there's no new and exciting things to report, but, um, but working with this team, you know, my role is really to liaise between the CSO office and the people doing the work. So um, um, making sure that the program manages the funding appropriately, that it's reviewed appropriately, that the review board is um, fair and balanced uh, and not just, you know, groups of friendly reviewers. So next I'll tell you a little bit, switching gears, about the Allison Institute, which is also a new institutional philanthropic program that's been in um, place for about a year now. And so the immune system um, was shown back in the 90s that a negative regulator of T cell activation existed called CTLA-4. CTLA-4 is uh, present on T cells along with uh, PD-1, which is another immune checkpoint. Um, and what Jim Allison did was that uh, he later showed that blocking CTLA-4, so if you remove that inhibitory signal so that the T cells are just active all the time, actually resulted in tumor rejection in mice. And this early discovery was uh, fundamental, um, so fundamental, in fact, that he ended up winning the Nobel Prize. Uh, in 2018. Um, he was not at, all, at MD Anderson when he made this discovery, yet he was at MD Anderson when he won the Nobel Prize, so we take credit for that. <laughs> um, but he is the professor and chair of the Department of Immunology. And others, he's a basic scientist, um, others uh, who are physicians and physician scientists have since shown that combinations of immune checkpoint inhibitors do increase survival um, and extend survival in advance. Melanoma patients shown here in the green bar, you can see the combination therapy is more effective over either single therapy, um, but also in other advanced cancers like lung cancer, prostate cancer, renal cell. 
And so it's really become appreciated that immunotherapy is now considered to be the fifth pillar of cancer therapy, where you have traditionally surgery, radiation, and chemo. Within the last you know, 10 to 15 years, we've appreciated that precision therapy approaches or targeted therapies are also very effective, and most recently, immunotherapy. And all of these, um, but specifically immunotherapy, can kind of work in combination with the other. And so we've shown this, and others have shown this in a handful of cancers. And so there are still a number of cancers that don't respond to immunotherapy at all, or a number of patients in those disease types who don't respond. So how do we bring these cures to all patients who have um, many different types of cancers? And that's really the mission of the Allison Institute, which is aimed at you know, advancing this uh, across disciplines and unlocking the full potential of immunotherapy. Um, and so the Allison Institute has been in, in you know, existence for about a year, um, and they have recruited about three faculty members in that year, so their, their funding is really providing foundational funding and recruitment dollars to individuals wanting to study immunotherapy and immunobiology and establish labs at MD Anderson. And so um, we're excited about the discoveries they're going to make with the resources of this institute because it's going to be quite big. And so finally, just to tell you a little bit about um, the, one of the external research programs I work on. So um, this is the Breakthrough Cancer Foundation. This was established by the Goodwin family of Richmond, Virginia, um, who donated $250 million to many institutions, five institutions together, to establish, um, to basically attack the most intractable um, cancers. And so um, they have actually relied on a lot of the shared principles that we have in the Moonshots program. We've been sort of advisors to them along the way. As they've established this, breaking down the silos now, just not within a single institution, but across multiple institutions, you imagine not everyone likes to collaborate and share all the data. And so um, this has been an interesting um, pro project to be involved in, certainly from the institutional perspective. Um, and so there are uh, four different cancers being looked at right now. And along with MD Anderson, there's MIT, who's bringing kind of interesting data science approaches to all of these different disease types, Dana-Farber, Memorial Sloan Kettering, um, and Johns Hopkins. So all working together to form multi-institutional teams um, to manage and, uh, and attack these different types of cancers. And so you'll see that these four types of cancers also overlap a lot with what we're doing in the Moonshots program. So from an institutional perspective, having the scope that I do, we then sort of limit the funding that we're maybe giving to these same teams for doing the same types of work. Um, so we adjust that, um, which is helpful in our overall stewardship of funds. And so I've told you about lots of different team science approaches aimed at helping our most um, sick patients, and that's what drives, um, there's 25,000 people who work at MD Anderson, which is about the size of this undergraduate campus. So it's a huge amount of people all aimed at doing the same thing, which is helping more people and helping them live longer. And so the work that I've stewarded, while I'm not at the bench pipetting anymore and I'm not writing grants, I do feel like has done what you know any researcher would hope to do with their career in helping um, patients live longer and better lives and helps me wake up a little bit excited every day to go do it all again. And so if I had to give you a few tips, <laughs> it would be that career trajectories are not always linear and that is okay. Um, it's you are where you're supposed to be, wherever that might be. And so I also feel like perseverance and emotional intelligence will get you most of the way. Um, I use my technical capabilities and understanding some, but, um, but really my ability to empathize and be kind and do what I say I'm gonna do is really like the majority of my job. Um, consider constructive criticism and your own gaps in your, in your path and use that to propel you forward. And then um, something I've been told more recently is to begin developing a personal advisory board. Um, someone maybe described it as a wolf pack. Um, and I think that that's a great, a great thing to have. So if you've got people who always are kind of on your side and want the best for you, 
and they can be your mom who's on the Zoom call watching you right now, or they can be, you know, your former mentor, or they can be, you know, friends who can give you really objective advice. I think having people who you trust, whether it's professionally or personally, is just so important for all of us kind of as we navigate the world. So um, that's it. I just I would like to thank the Sassamans. I appreciate this opportunity more than you'll ever know. Um, obviously, Dr. Goodwin um, and uh, Kim for inviting me, um, Ashley and, and the whole college. So thank you so much.